taking the time out to join us. We have Kenny who is going to be um, going over some test taking strategies for us. We know that uh, taking tests can be really stressful. So he is gracious enough to share some pointers with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Okay. And I am Isela Gonzalez Santana, the Learning Center Director. Um, and welcome, welcome. I know, I know, I think one person, Kuhira, but other than that, everyone else, someone I have not met. So nice to see you. Nice, to, well, nice to meet you here, and I'm glad you're here. Um, and this is this workshop is being sponsored by the Learning Center. And in case you have not visited the Learning Center, we are. On Zoom, we provide tutoring services across disciplines, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Mondays through Thursdays, and on Friday from 10 to 3 p.m. So, you know, if you need help, if you've been struggling, it's not too late, you can still come in anytime between our open hours and get the help that you need. Uh, Kenny Masha is one of our great tutors in the Learning Center. Um, and I say great with a lot of meaning because he, he's one of the tutors who's kind of been with us, I think now two or three semesters. And he provides um, a lot of academic help. Like he will take on groups of students when we were on campus to, to uh, review material. And just, he's very, very sincere about his willingness to help students. Um, and so he's more in the sciences, but he's actually, a kind of a renaissance man. He tutors not just in the sciences, but also math, even writing, and even some Spanish. Uh, so I really want to introduce you to Kenny Masha, one of our great tutors who's going to be talking about test taking strategies. So, thank oh, you so much for about yourself, Kenny, about her, your nursing, your, your, what you've been going through right now with the, the nursing program. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Thank you so much for introducing me. So as I said, my name is Kenny. I've, uh, I am a post-grad. I graduated from the University of Houston um, with my degree in biology and my minor in mathematics. And I've been a tutor at the Learning Center for the last three semesters, but I've been a tutor since 2014, I believe. So um, I do have a lot of experience when it comes to taking tests and, and getting people prepared and teaching people. Um, and as Mrs. Asella said, with the effort that I was able to, to make in regards to going back to school, I've now been accepted into the nursing program at Samuel Merritt. So I'll be starting there in January. Um, yeah. So a lot of the people that come to me, I know that they typically are looking to do a nursing program and nursing programs ask a lot of their students to do whether that be an English class, math class, a science class, um, biology, even Spanish and, and philosophy, things that seem outside the purview of nursing. Um, so I typically do a lot of work trying to get people prepared and getting people ready for taking their tests and even preparing just for nursing in general, or even just preparing for something as simple as the entrance exam as like the P's of the HESI. So, what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm going to be explaining some of the things that you can do to take a test and to prepare for taking a test. And in, in the reality of it, when it comes to preparing for a test and being comfortable, there's no real easy trick. You have to just prepare and set up the way before you start that test. There are certain things, certain, certain things that you can do in the test to kind of up your chances, but the best way for any type of success is preparation. And that's what I'm gonna be going over on this particular, um, this workshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? So, so I, like I said, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking about preparing for a test. And um, I know a lot of people, the first thing I wanna say is a lot of people have difficulty preparing for tests and they wonder, wow, maybe this teacher's too hard. This teacher doesn't like me. This teacher, um, she just wants us to fail. She doesn't care. And I think that is one of the common misconceptions that a lot of people have. And I want people to understand that teachers aren't monsters. Teachers, they want you to su succeed. They really want you to do, do their best. These tests that they're, that they're designing, they're, they're supposed to help you succeed in the future. They want you to do better than they ever did on the subject. And that's why they're teaching these classes. They're teaching these classes so that they can pass on the knowledge that they've learned 
and that you won't have to incur the difficult um, the difficulties they had when they were in school or when they were um, or when they were um, working towards being the people that they are. They want you. They always want you to have it easier. Never there's never a teacher out there who wants you to have it harder than you. They want you to enjoy their class to to get out and say, "Wow, I learned something, and I can use this later on in the future." Now. The first thing that I find that a lot of people have difficulty in is how they study. And we have to ask, like sometimes it's not necessarily the class is hard or the material is difficult. It may be the way that a person approaches this material. And the first thing to ask is, I feel like if you have to spend up to four or five hours a night studying, you may be you may not be studying correctly. Um, you may need to approach it in a different way and there's different ways for you to study. Um, and that's what I wanna do first before we get into actually taking the test and preparing. So the first thing I wanna say is how do we study? And I'm gonna choose lecture slides because there's a couple ways that people study. And I'm paused, I got this kind of a little bit out of order, but with me, my preference for studying is always with lecture slides teachers are great they they are they some teachers are really good at explaining the materials some people like to focus on recordings but lecture slides I can always go back to it I can analyze the lecture slide and I can and I can and I can always use it towards the material that I'm looking at or whatever whatever material that I'm given but first in order for us to just understand if we need to study with lecture slides we need to understand the differences between these lectures the lecture slides versus recordings Recordings are just, you know, whatever the teacher records to see later on. So for me with lectures, I don't feel that lectures are for everybody. It doesn't mean that they're not important, but some people don't work well with lectures. Some teachers have a difficult time grasping a student's attention when they teach. Um, sometimes you might be in class and everything's just flying over your head or a teacher has a difficult time explaining words or breaking it down for people to understand. And then in some cases, students have difficult times focusing on the lectures. You may have a learning disability. You may be somebody who just um, is starting college and you're in a class where there's a lot of verbiage that they've used beforehand. And you're like, whoa, I've never seen this. What is this? Where, like how, you know, you can't stop the teacher and it makes it hard for you to stop it. You feel embarrassed or whatnot. So it's not for everyone. However, you have to understand that there are pros of lectures because teachers, as I said, they're not monsters. Some teachers are very good about letting you know what questions will be on that test. Um, if you look here on this slide, I put here some questions that I pulled off the internet and they very specifically said, in the lecture, we discuss the way, you know, the, the US had answered the questions of who protects African-American civil rights and so forth. They chose something very specifically that they took out of their lecture. That's that's sometimes on the test you'll find stuff that they only spoke about in the lecture and truth of the matter is teachers aren't aren't gonna do that to you a lot maybe about one percent of the time or one percent of the test is something that the teacher said over the lecture but a lot of it is based off of the information that they taught in class and a lot of the information they taught in class can be found on the lecture slide as well and the, the other thing is teachers do tend to go over a vast amount of information that may be useless to you when you're studying for a test and it's difficult for people to understand it but it is still good for you to know that because later on you never know when you're going to need that information so outside of it just being for that specific test it may be for something in the future that would be useful now we're going to go on to what i find my favorite and we're going to talk about the pros of lecture slides now i love lecture slides because they're straight to the point they're concise um, everything that a teacher said in about 15 minutes can be said in about three to four lines. Um, it it, it kind of helps cut straight to the point. And the good thing about lecture slides that I that I love that teachers do, they're really good about putting key testing points on that lecture slides. So things that you should really be focusing on. So you'll see it with stuff with asterisks. You see it in bolded letters. You'll see it with um, bullet points and so forth. They'll even put it in just like a singular a slide by itself and just state something. They're really good about it. And then the good thing about lecture slides that I like is it's easier for me to visualize and understand the material that's being portrayed on the lecture slides. Um, lecture slides, I can always access it on my own time. 
I can look through it. Teachers are really good about taking pictures and trying their best to, to give you something that you can see and, and comprehend and understand and just stating in the words. Um, and then when you read lecture slides, they do help students improve their ability to understand the written material. So I'd probably say about 95% of the time, lecture slides can replace what can replace reading the textbook. Now, the reason why I say it can replace reading the textbook information from the textbook already, and they put that onto the lecture slides. So, um, and then it's a lot easier to tell what is necessary and unnecessary information for a test as opposed to actually going to a lecture. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to a lecture, y'all. Don't, don't take it like that. So now we're gonna talk about the pros of recordings are pretty much very similar to the lectures. The only thing that I like about lecture, about recordings is, once again, you can do this stuff on your own time. If you're a person who works in the morning and your class is in the morning, you can come back to the pro, to the recording at night. Or it's vice versa, if you work at night, you can come back to the recording in the morning. Um, and then the, the other thing that I like about it is you can take the material that you've learned on the, you have on the lecture slide and compare it to the recordings to see what's important and, and, and what to focus on and so forth. Now, the real question is, we're still focusing on how do you study? And everybody has different study types and we need to figure out how to study using any of the three, um, depending on what, what your studying type is. And once again, I do wanna just reiterate it, teachers are not monsters. Um, teachers are really good about helping their students. And one of the greatest tools that I found that teach, a lot of teachers use is they create something called an exam study guide, right? Um, so these teachers have this exam study guide and they will outline exactly what to expect on that test. They do this because they know that studying can be a lot. There's a lot of material to go over and they don't want you, they want you to succeed. So they'll say, hey, I'm probably gonna be testing on this. There's a good chance of testing on this and so forth. And you'll see that on the, an exam study guide. And what I love about the exam study guides is you take this study guide and you take it back together with your lecture, your lecture slide or the recordings that you're watching and you can compare it. And these exam study guides typically look like this. It's very straight and to the point. What is sociology? The study of social life, sociological imagination. And they talk about key points. And some teachers are on the money. They'll tell you if you study, sometimes if you study exactly the, social, the study guide, that's all you need at, for, to take the test. Um, now, the other thing is you're comparing your study material with your exam outline. Now, during a lecture, it does help you to know where to really focus your attention. So one of the things that I used to do when I was a student is I take that in and I go to school and I go to class and I sit down and every time the teacher starts to speak on that very specific thing, that's why I focus on taking notes. It's very helpful to have that exam outlined with you when you're studying, when you're taking, when you're in lecture, when you're reading your lecture slides, or even if you're just looking at the recording. Now, one of the things that, one of the things that I've saw that a lot of people have difficulty with is they have a difficult time trying to figure out verbiage and certain words. And I have a really, really nice technique that I do for this. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of times getting past these difficult words and subjects, you're gonna have to do a lot of repetition. So if you have some material that you're studying and you don't use a lot of words, and I think one of the science-based classes are typically the thing that, that has those words that's so difficult to get through. Ribosomes, um, you know, DNA, mRNA, tRNA, um, you know, protein, cytoplasm and so forth. Those are, there's so many different verbiages and terms that they use that it's hard for people to understand. And, and what I like to do is when I had a very difficult time first trying to get through my biology degree, um, when I first studied, what I would do is I'd write down the definitions of words that I knew I was gonna be using, um, that I'd see that, or that I had difficulty understanding. And then I write the, and then what I do is every time I wrote my notes and I had to use that word, I wrote in that definition. So I gave an example here. You can see it says ribosomes, ribosomes molecules that make proteins by using amino acids. And then I continue the sentences till I hit words that I had difficulties. So ribosomes, translation. If you do this for about a page or two, you're never gonna forget what a ribosome is, or you're never gonna forget the translation or any of these other words that you have difficulty with. And then the other good thing that I like is also pictures. Pictures help you visualize and see what it is. 
and help you really focus on on trying to get past that word, oh, ribosomes with those little red things that we saw over the little blue things that, that the mRNA passes through. So that is just some of the things that I wanted to bring up in terms of trying to just getting yourself prepared for the test. Now, that's just using the material that the teachers are giving you, the lectures, the outlines, the recordings, and so forth. But sometimes that's not enough for a student to be successful. And in order for them to be successful, you always have to go up and above. So one of the best ways to go up and above is to find these outside tools that you use to study. And one of the most underused tools, but one of the most, like it's probably one of the best tools I've ever seen since it's, it came out, YouTube. YouTube has, Hold on, um, Kenny, your recording is a little, under, it's unstable a bit, so keep going. Oh, I'm sorry. So one of the things that I realized that, so one of the things that people don't realize is when it comes to YouTube, these people want to gain subscribers. And the only way that they gain subscribers, because subscribers equals money for them. And the way that they gain subscribers is they have more people who come and come to their, their lectures or whatever they're doing. And the only reason people would come is if they do a great job of explaining or clarifying a, sub, uh, a subject that they've had a difficult time with. So you'll always find hundreds, thousands of people online who will literally explain, show you tricks, step-by-step -step techniques for problem solving or solving that very specific thing that you're trying to understand or, or give you examples that, that relate to you. And you're like, oh, it makes a lot more sense. Um, it's, YouTube is a really helpful tool. And then my second favorite tool out of all of these is Quizlet. So with Quizlet, the good thing is you can find you can find a lot of questions on that particular subject that you are working on. There's millions of Quizlets out there, and you can always find something on anatomy, physiology, art, whatever, or whatever specific subjects you're looking for. And if you're really good, you can even find subjects that people have created with the same exact teacher that you have. So it'll be very, very course specific to what you're, what you're doing. Um, I know I've, cre I created a couple Quizlets myself on, for one of my anatomy classes. And then like I Googled her name and I typed in Quizlet, I found maybe 20 or 30 other people who had very similar Quizlet or something different that I used to study. It was the same material, but slightly different. And I was able to use to quiz myself and test myself on it. And the great thing is you can make up your own questions to practice and study on. So if you know, if you have that outline and you know exactly what you're, you're gonna be studying and gonna be working on, you make up quizlets, you can go back and forth and do that on a daily basis. And you can learn material really quickly. The other tip that I like to have is old exams. Now, um, old exams, it's the thing about old exams that I love is it's hard for somebody to explain something in two, three different ways. If I was to ask you to explain how to make ice, you can tell me, oh, you fill up something with water, you put it in a, in a, in a freezer and it freezes, right? And then if I actually explain it in a different way, it's kind of hard. Oh, well, I guess you can take a cup and you can put um, water halfway up and you put it in a refrigerator or freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius. No matter how you repeat it over and over again, it's the same concept, just explained in different ways. And that's the good thing I like about old exams. A lot of times teachers have a lot of difficult times making up new exams. So they'll either change a few things about the old exams or revamp it just a little bit. Now, old exams aren't always available, but it can be found. And a lot of like, you can usually typically Google a teacher's name and exam one, you know, microbiology or whatever and so forth. And you can find these old exams. Um, and even if it's not the same exam that you're going to be that you're going to be tested on, if it's similar, you can still use it to practice, and it helps you expect what kind of questions your teacher is going to be asking when you do take your test. Uh, and this particular exam that I posted here, um, when I was in taking my organic chemistry class at the University of Houston, um, this is what we did. We searched up our old my teacher's old exams, and we found this, and they were very similar. Um, one of them's asking for, for you to name something, and the other one's asking you to, for you to name something. They're slightly different, but 
you know exactly what to expect when you're going to be taking the test. It's a great, it's a great test taking preparation tool. But the one thing that a lot of people don't utilize enough, and I feel like they should do is talking to ex students who actually took this class. So people who were previously in the class have the best idea of how a teacher teaches, what to expect, what to focus on and, do, and, and so forth. They're great resources for knowing how to study for a teacher's tests. And a lot of times um, teachers will give back their materials or they may have some stuff that you didn't know that you, that you needed, that they can provide to you and that you can use to study with or you can use to prepare for your tests. And then one of my biggest things that I think that a lot of people should do and it is underutilized is teaching somebody. Um, I feel like one of the reasons why I do so great, I, I mean, I, I do so well at, teach, at tutoring is because I did a lot of teaching. When I first started tutoring people and teaching people, you know, how to learn and how this and that, I had the, the, the hardest time explaining to them they were trying to learn. However, over time, I realized, well, that must mean I might not know that concept as well as I, I, as I thought. If I'm trying to explain something to you and you're not understanding it, then I don't have a great enough grasp on it that I can explain it to you. So I need to go back and I need to look at what I'm doing and see if I can come back to you to explain it to you. And if you're somebody who's never taken this course, but I can explain it to you in a, in a couple sentences and it makes perfect sense, then that means that I understand the concept. And that's why I think teaching is such a great tool. Um, I still continue to do it to this day, working in the learning center. Um, so if, if anybody wants to take a swing at it, I highly recommend um, you talk to Mr. Seller about possibly tutoring, but it really does help you. It really does open the way that you think and thinking critically, because even if you take a class and you've done the same thing over and over and over again, you may meet somebody who has a slightly different teacher and who approaches a question slightly differently. And you uh, understand the concept. Kenny, so and you have a, a, one, one, a student here has a couple comments in the chat box. Um, and I wasn't sure if you wanted to just wait till the end and, and but it's, it's not, they're not questions, they're more like statements. Uh, oh, but I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay, so Yanali Madrid says there is a, there is visual auditory and hands-on study techniques that help students. And then she also says, yes, it is also important that the school create a strong sense of community in, in, or in for older alumni to come back and help students. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I apologize. I'm trying to get my chat. chat it's okay. No like, worry. Don't worry about it, Kenny. You're doing great. So, but no, I think she's 100% right on what she said. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there's a huge community and it's underutilized by a lot of people. A lot of people come into college and the first thing that they do when they come into college is I have to do this all by myself. I need to stay at home. I need to study. And that's, that's not true. There's a lot of different resources that people should use. And I feel like um, teaching is one of those huge resources. The ex students is one of those resources, the old exams, YouTube, Quizlet. But the, one of the best resources that I, to this day, I 100% I promote is study groups. I feel like a lot of people like to go about it by themselves, but the thing about study groups is they're amazing. You meet people from different cultures, different ethnicities. And not only that, um, there's always someone in that group that has useful material for everyone. They may have their own notes. They may have notes that they found somebody. They may have known some students from previously who gave them material, who was able to help them. Um, and then the other thing that I think a lot of people will forget is two heads are better than one. When you, when you approach a problem and you can't think of any way to get past that problem, you're stuck and you're trying to figure out how to do it. And then somebody comes around and says, oh, well, you didn't look at it in this way. And you're just like, wow, I didn't think about that. And can, if two heads are better than one, then four, five, six heads. It's, it's study groups are amazing tools that a lot of people should, should use. And the one thing that I really love about study groups, because I'm a huge procrastinator, um, and study groups, what they do is they make you stick to a schedule. Hey, we're having a meeting next week, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Um, we're gonna be studying for two hours. Um, instead of me waiting till the very last day to study, now I feel dedicated to, I feel like I have to go to the study group. And when I go, I learn so much in that two hours and I have to spend less time the day before studying for the exam. And the more and more you do that, the more and more prepared you're gonna be for a test. 
And like I said, study groups, you always find different perspectives when you, when you, when you do uh, meet up with your group. So those are just some of the tools that you can use outside of just the lectures, the recordings, or um, even the lecture slides for studying. Now, um, like I said, most times, preparation is the best key and success to, to take an exam. But there are small little things that you can do while you're taking the test to maximize it. Because sometimes you may feel prepared, you may feel that you know the material. And then when you go in and take the test, it's like, oh, what, you know, like what's going on? I know this stuff and you lose it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you some of these tips that you can use while taking the test. And I don't know if a lot, of, I feel like everybody has had this moment before where they're studying something and they're studying and studying it and they just can't, they can't get down this one concept. So right before the test, you're like, oh, I've learned everything but this. And you're just trying to cram it in and memorize it real quick. And then when you get into the test, you're like, oh, I just learned this. What, what, what is this? What, what is it again? You know, they're asking me right now a question I can't remember. It. So what I tell people to do is do something called a memory dump. So when you start taking that test and you're trying to hold on to that little bit, bit of information that it's, it's hard for you to, to keep, when you start that test, write it down somewhere on the paper, on the test, so that you never forget it. So that way, if you do forget it, you can always come back to it. Um, that's, that's super key. And then the other thing that I think that a lot of people do on tests is they look at a test and they say, oh, this test is so easy, but they don't watch for tricky wording. And here I have like an example of a riddle I've seen on Facebook a lot. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. Well, does anybody know the answer to this particular question? I don't know if anybody wants to, to give it a chance. Somebody says zero, somebody said two. Somebody said, um, somebody oh. said zeros, yeah. somebody said two. Um, so so I, what the thing is, I'd like people to analyze it. So you, you have to look for what they're asking for. They're asking for how many legs are on the floor. And then like when you're taking a test, you should look at what they're asking for, but you should also look at what they feel is relevant, is irrelevant, right? They're telling you what's above the bed. I mean, what's on the floor. So there's three chickens flying above the bed. Do we really need that? No, we don't need those chickens, they're gone, right? And then also it's telling you that on the bed, there's two dogs, four cats, giraffe, five cows, and a duck. So are any of their legs on the floor? No, right? And then is there anything missing in this question? Somebody said four, you're getting closer. Is there anything else missing in this question that, that we're missing? I feel, Chris, I, I think I know where you're getting four from because you're saying from the bed, right? <laughs> yeah, it has four, right? So do you know what the answer is? Oop. It's six six legs on the floor. So the reason why it's six, once again, they asked, um, they asked, you walk into a room. You completely forgot about that. So they do like you to apply critical thinking to when you take your tests. So you're forgetting yourself, you're forgetting the bed, you're just so focused. They, they may give you a bunch of irrelevant information, the dogs, the cats, the giraffe, the cows, the duck, the chickens, and so forth. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> the assuming the bed is not directly on the floor, but in this particular case, they they do and there's a what's the word? Yeah, sometimes it's it's not fair, but they they're trying to make the assumption of like what most beds would be like. So with that being said, here's another one. This one, um, if you've ever taken a tease, this is a question that is on the tease. And once again, you, I just want you to look at the things that are irrelevant, look at what they're asking for and see if you're missing anything. And Kenny, can you just explain what the tease is? Oh, I'm sorry. So the tease is one of the, the exams, the entrance exams needed to get into nursing school. There are two different entrance, entrance exams. There's the HESI and the tease. I don't know what the abbreviation stands for, I, I, but um, Typically, a lot of people have a lot of difficulty on the T's and the HESI because it's basic math, science, English, and, and reading. Um, and, but a lot of the questions on the T's 
are designed to trick you up. They seem very simple. They seem very straightforward. But in, in a lot of cases, people miss something because they're reading through it so fast or they're so stressed out. And this is one of the things that I, I'm trying to explain to people that you should take your time. Um, read it, just try to make sure that you're getting all the information and that you're noting everything and you're not forgetting anything. So in this particular case, does anybody know what the answer is? I'll give it about 30 seconds. Okay, so Ronique said C. Does anybody say C? Okay, so Ronique, you are correct. He did leave his work. That is that is exactly what happened. He left his work before before coming in. And like I said, they they gave up a lot of irrelevant information to trick people. And a lot of some teachers will do that. Like I said, they just want you to think a little bit more critically. But once again, they don't want you to fail. They do want you to do well. Um, so another thing that a lot of people should do when they're taking a test is try to use the process of elimination for questions that are difficult. Um, read that question, look for keywords, underline them if you, if you need to. In this particular question, they're asking which of the following is a primary source of information. And to me, that keyword is primary. And primary, like, you know, if you're talking with a friend or, you know, everybody knows gossip. Everybody's heard of what gossip is and so forth. That's when somebody says this about you and so forth and yada, yada, yada. Well, you don't want to hear it from other people. You want to hear it from the cow's mouth. You want to know exactly who told you that. And that's that primary source of information. So what you need to do is you need to evaluate these answer choices and you need to figure out, oh, well, I know primary means that it's direct, something exactly that was there at the moment and so forth. Um, so what can I do to figure out which one of these would represent that answer? and evaluate the answer choices. Um, you're t there's a speech that's referring to an event. Um, that speech is a secondary source of information because it's not the event in there. So I can get rid of that. Uh, I, I can, what about B? It's a photograph taken at an event. That photograph is, is so the, the problem with number one is it refers to an event. It's not, an, it's not a speech that was at the event. It just only refers to it. Number two, a photograph that was taken at the event. So it does lock in an image of something that happened there. Uh, C, it says a textbook description of an event. And once again, that's just like gossip to me. Um, you know, you could describe what happened and so forth, but if you weren't exactly there, you wouldn't be able to know. Uh, or a newspaper article about the event. Everything's just written about it. But what's a primary source of information to me is something that was actually there that, that you can say, oh, whoop, I have physical proof. This is the person, this is it, this is yada, yada, yada. It's nothing that's secondhand. Um, now, the other question that a lot of people have difficulty on is true or false questions. And true or false questions, one of the things that you should always look for is strong words, such as always or all, right? Um, and the reason why I say you should look for these words is because sometimes, a lot of times things aren't always, always something like this or all the time like this. Most times, Strong words like always and all will indicate a false answer. Now, I don't want you to say like, oh, because I always, I see the word always, I'm always gonna do that. Because once again, always is not the, the definitive answer. You shouldn't bank on that. But a lot of times teachers specifically put in always and all because they want you to, to understand like, hey, this isn't true. So that's why some of these examples like all cats are white, not all cats are white. It, that doesn't always, you know, that's not the truth. But the rest of it, you can you can look for comparisons and see if it relates to common knowledge. Can a horse fly? Well, common knowledge is they can't fly. Can flowers sing? Common knowledge is they can't sing. Frogs can jump. And you can use that to answer your questions. Um, I also gave another example to compare what was being said in the statement to see if there's enough information on both sides of whether it's true or if it's false to give a definitive answer. I ask, dogs are more easily trainable than cats. They wait for you at home. They can sometimes make a mess, but they mean well, and dogs always show you love and affection. So with that being said, 
does that mean dogs make better pets than cats? True or false? And we've already seen that in that statement, they say all these great things about dogs, but one, they don't really explain about cats. And one of the other things that they said about dogs is they can sometimes make a mess. So that doesn't necessarily indicate that they'll be better. So you can, all, you can obviously say false on that one. So if they were to ask something like, oh, dogs are more easily trainable, true, true or false, well, based off that prompt, even though that common knowledge might say that's not true, based off that prompt, we can say that was true. That's why you want to always want to compare the, the information between true and false, seeing if you have enough information to go off of the true answers and if you have enough information to go off of the false one to see if you can get a definitive answer for that. And then um, the one that most people have the toughest time with, which I 100% understand why, is essay questions. Essay questions are difficult. The only way to do well in essay questions, you have to practice before you take that test multiple times. Teachers are really good about what they want on that essay. They want you to answer very specific points. If you're writing essays in a um, in an English form, you should definitely follow these key points. You know, get your point, put supporting ex uh, evidence, and you know, give an example. Um, so try to get down that outline if you can. That outline is really good to focus on. And then write down the supporting information and in everything that you do. Once you get that outline down, it makes it a lot easier for you to focus on how to write everything else out. And you can fill in the blank. But essay questions are tough and you're gonna just have to practice on it over and over and over again. It's one of the few ways that you can do it. And lastly, when it comes to taking your test, make sure you have enough time to prepare and study. Um, I know that everybody's different. Everybody's different when it comes to, to taking the test. Some person, some people can study for a day. Some people it takes them two weeks. Some people take them a month. Just make sure you have enough time to study. Um, and then don't get bogged down saying, I can't understand the material, I can't study it. You know, take a break, come back to it later because you come back with a fresh mind, you might be able to approach it a lot better. And then don't forget to breathe, relax, get some exercise, don't stress yourself out. And Use all the free resources that you can that you have at your fingertip, and especially at school, as there are lots and lots of tutors who are there to help you. And that's it. If does anybody have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. There's only you know we're not a big crowd here, so just feel free to ask any questions or make any comments at this time. Thank you, Kenny. That was great. Not a problem. Or maybe any um, other methods people do while they prepare for a test or while they're taking a test. Um, well, uh, I'll mention that what I'll do um, for a test is I'll answer the questions that I know the answer to and then um, come back to the ones that are a little more trickier. Just yeah. um, to make sure that I'm using my time correctly. No, I 100% agree. Um, it sometimes people can get stuck on a question for over 15 minutes trying to figure it out, and they've lost maybe a quarter of their time doing that. So definitely, I 100% agree. When you're taking a test, if there's a question that's difficult for you, go on to the next one, keep going, and come back to it at the end. So. But that's great. That's a very great tool. Does anybody else have any tools that they would like to, to bring in? Anything that I didn't I didn't mention as well? So so I I, I cut it a little short just because I know I felt that there may have been some time that people wanted to ask. No, no, was good. no worries. Are you guys sure there aren't any questions? Because I think the idea of uh, Ronique asking, like, what do you guys do? What is it? What are some techniques that you do that maybe uh, wasn't mentioned and you want to add to this conversation? Uh, somebody said, I think it was Chris who said, repetition is key, which I know that Kenny, you, you mentioned the, the key, the, the need to repeat things over and over again. That is true. And uh, I know like a lot of you guys will have to take some type of entrance exam or some type of exam for whatever program you're getting into, mm -hmm. um, be it outside of just, you know, healthcare and so forth. I know like, um, like chemists have to take an exam or um, 
Like you may have to take a GRE, just whatever. Um, you're right, repetition is key. You're gonna have to practice on those questions over and over again. Um, I taking, I personally taking the MCAT, the DAT, the GRE, the T's and the HESI. Mm -hmm. um, and surprisingly enough, I felt like the GRE was the hardest. But the only way that I was able to do well in all of those is repetition. I practiced on those questions over and over again. I felt like I knew stuff and um, because I had tutored. And when I came to it, it seemed like a whole different language. And I realized, oh, this is the same stuff that I'm learning just presented to me in a different way. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I was able to get good enough to, to do well on it is I had to practice on it over and over again through repetition. Mm -hmm. So. I'm a little curious to know, like, I know Kahira is going into the sciences, um, actually into nursing. What about the rest of you? What, what areas are you guys working toward? I'm um, working towards environmental science. So I'm trying to figure out if I want to um, go into policy or stick to uh, laboratory and being outside. Um, if I wanna be an ecologist or geologist or geographer, uh, but that's environmental science is, is my overall. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wow. Yeah, that was something I kinda wanted to do when I first got out of college. I didn't get lucky enough to do it. I just, I kind of got stuck in a chem lab mm -hmm. working as a chemist for some time. But it's, I think environmental science is a, it's great going out there, being around nature, getting to actually help and do a, do do just things for the environment. I think, I think it's great. It's really respectable. Yeah, we recently had a workshop uh, and Brad Belukshian, who is our uh, instructor in environmental science. I don't remember the exact name of the, of the program, but He's really working hard at reviving our environmental science program at Merritt College. And his whole thing is about getting outside and doing your office is the outdoors, you know, it's not being inside. So I see Chris is saying that perhaps business, but he's indecisive, but hey, you're welcome for the presentation. It, it was my pleasure. Um, Chris, I just, the only thing I, t I would recommend is try to shadow somebody who's doing business or whatever whatever area you're looking into and just kind of see what it is from a day-to-day -day perspective. See if that's something you might like. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah. And so it's I, such I, an expansive field. You know, there's so many different ways to do business or to get into the business industry, all right? Yeah, and I just wanted to share uh, something that I do uh, the night before I take a test to kind of um, help reduce my anxiety around it is to go to sleep early, make sure that I'm getting enough rest. And um, in the morning, just kind of briefly going over uh, questions that I know may be tricky and having like tea to calm me down. <laughs> cool, that's great. Great tips. All right. Well, thank you again, Kenny Masha. That's awesome. And please come see him if you don't, if you haven't been to the Learning Center, come see Kenny and all the other wonderful tutors that we have there. Um, I think uh, Ronique had given you guys the link to the Learning Center, which has the Zoom link. So if you just go to the Learning Center, uh, which is on the Merritt College website, and you click on Learning Center, it'll take you straight to that Zoom link and you'll automatically connect to us. You don't have to pay for the services, they're absolutely free. Um, and you'll meet some great tutors and maybe you will become a tutor as well because that was one of the, the techniques that Kenny mentioned is, is you learn by teaching, right? You learn by actually, re, you're reinforcing material by teaching someone else the material. And I think she also put in the group chat, um, if you guys could uh, just go out, go and fill out the form, right? I mean, sorry fill out yeah. the form for the workshop evaluation. Um, it does really does, it, it helps a lot for the learning center. Yeah. So if you guys have a chance to do that, it'd be really appreciated. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm.